Welcome, Bishop. How are you? Ron, thank you. Welcome to you and welcome to our viewers and listeners. As always, great to have you with us and great to be able to produce the Bishop's Corner. Yeah, and before we get to our gospel, let's talk about things on your agenda and coming up. And... Thank you. So I think really just a few things, and one of them is uh, a Sunday Mass at the cathedral, which is not common in the summertime, but with mm -hmm. vacations and whatnot, I'm always happy to fill in. You know, uh, we had a joke in the seminary, if a priest can't make it and somebody else can, and they they really just can't, they just want to get somebody to fill in, they just say, well, you're Father, you'll do. <laughs> So, Father, you'll so do. I'm going to be Father, you'll do, teasing, of course. I'm always delighted to be able to celebrate at our cathedral, and it's always a blessing, even when it's when it's a, quote, simple Sunday Mass. But there are those who will tell you that when the bishop's around, it's never simple. So that's just where we are. Then uh, it, on that Wednesday, July 13th, we're doing another Annunciation radio taping. And on the 14th, Ron, I'm scheduled to be the celebrant and homilist for Mass and then to lead Stations of the Cross uh, for a group of young people at camp, at Camp de Sales in Brooklyn, Michigan, which is run by our Oblates, the Oblates of St. Francis yeah, de Sales. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Anything else? Great. I think you that's, talk about? That, I think we're going to talk about the uh, Eucharistic revival with a question. Uh, I think you're right. There okay. we go. So we'll, we'll hold it Let's go ahead that. and dive into a, well, let's go to the gospel first. Thank Why don't we do that? And we're going to go to a recent gospel from Luke from the 14th Sunday in Ordinary time. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick in it, and say to them, The kingdom of God is at hand for you. Your thoughts, Bishop. Of course, folks, some of you will say, well, Bishop, the gospel was longer on Sunday at our parish. <laughs> and of course, as you know, because we're on the radio, we took the shorter version, which is approved by the church, because we don't have all the time in the world. We wish we did. But let's just look briefly at two fundamental realities from this gospel of Luke. I think that there, well, actually, let's look at three, because I like to operate in threes. So first of all, he appointed these people, and he sent them out in pairs. And I think that's a really critical note. No one is alone. So whenever people are sent out by Jesus, they're sent out in pairs. And, you know, it's not a, not a small reality that they are, done, are there to support one another. So no one is ever alone and sent in pairs so that they might work together for the kingdom. Then we're told, you know, this all of this carry no money, no sack, no sandals, don't greet anybody. Obviously, there should be no distraction from the proclamation they're making, and that is that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then lastly, he says, don't move about from one place to another, eat whatever they put before you, and cure the sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand. I think there's a simplicity there, and I think there's a very, very important note that we need to support one another in announcing the kingdom. So think of how, you know, even in your family or among your circle of friends, is there anybody who sometimes sort of seems to be out there on their own, you know, when they're in a family group or a group of friends, and they're the ones sort of defending the church when people are ripping her down, or, well, why does the church teach this or that? They shouldn't be left alone. You always have to tag team that. And I would say that's part of going out together. At tag teaming for the kingdom of God. Thank you. All right, good. Thanks, Bishop. Let's get to a question. How about that? Absolutely. We're going to go to Timothy in Toledo, uh, dear Bishop Thomas, with the three-year focus on the Eucharist. What plans are we in the Diocese of Toledo implementing to deepen the belief and devotion among the flock in our parishes? Thanks, Timothy. Thank you, Timothy, so much. And 
If you've been paying careful attention, and it appears you have, I'm so grateful you even know there is a three-year Eucharistic, National Eucharistic Revival, called for by the bishops of the United States, inaugurated in each diocese, as I did here, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of the Lord. And as I mentioned there, and actually on this show, Timothy, that we would be garnering a team together with from folks from all around our diocese, which would include lay people, a priest, a deacon, consecrated religious, so that we could discuss and plan and work toward just what we're going to do in the Diocese of Toledo. So you may be aware, and I would direct you, Timothy, you probably have seen it, but for all other listeners and viewers, you can go to the the uh, our website for the Eucharistic Revival or the USCCB website. And here's the mission. Of course, the whole title is My Flesh for the Life of the World. Mission, to renew the church by enkindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Vision, a movement of Catholics across the United States, healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist, and sent out in mission for the life of the world. So clearly, with what we do, and you've heard me say this before, we'll want to do what is realistic, what is doable, and what is achievable. And then I think we want to look at the end to say what would our hoped-for goal be and see what we do in the year dedicated to the diocesan work, the first year, parish work, and then work across the board. And I would ask you, Tim, if you would get involved in your parish to do this so as to encourage, just as you say so beautifully, to deepen the belief and the devotion among the flock in our parishes, I would add one thing to that, Timothy, the personal living out of the Eucharist by being Jesus to others. Thank you. Good. Let's get another one in, Bishop. Oh, my gosh. Do we have time? Break. We are. Well, We're the people are going to be very excited, Ron. I know it. <laughs> well, you didn't have a lot to talk about in the beginning, see? So, you know, so we have... Folks, I, o- which is I really always unusual, get ribbed Bishop. by Ron. I'm really telling you. Really unusual. All right. Get to the question, Ron. Thomas from St. <laughs> Catherine, dear Bishop, with our shifting population and shortage of priests, do you see any more parish uh, consolidations for our diocese coming soon? I worry about burnout with multi-church locations the pastors needs to cover. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas, so much. And I must confess, of course, my concern is your concern. My worry is your worry. That's exactly why we're doing intentional planning. And that's exactly why we're seeing some of these church consolidations. Unlike, Thomas, some churches in, for example, local churches like Detroit and Cincinnati, here in Toledo, we're not doing some sweeping conglomeration of eight, six parishes together, etc. But instead, we're looking towards some some new twinnings and some new configurations, very, very few, that might include three parishes. But don't forget, Thomas, even though there's one pastor, in all those cases, we're not taking a priest away from those communities. They still, for example, in one One place that had three parishes, there were two pastors. Now it'll be one pastor and two associates. So you have to remember, we're not so much cutting that number as we are providing, please God, to ensure the good health, because I'm worried about burnout too, the good health, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual of our priests, and the good pastoral care for all of the people in those parishes by our priests. So in most of the situations, they're not, quote, cut a priest. In some that are twinned, they are. But I hope you know it's all done through a very careful process, through boots on the ground, grassroots work with intentional planning, meeting with parish councils and those priests, and trying to come up with the best solution for those parishes. So that's our effort. And please, God, we will continue to do it, to care for our priests and care for our people. Yeah, we only have a minute or so left. I was at an ordination in Cincinnati Mm -hmm. about a month ago. I think you mentioned this on one of the shows, Ron. Yeah, I don't know if I I I couldn't remember if we talked about it on the show or off the off the air, but Mm -hmm. it was fascinating at the end to listen to the bishop give the assignments. Oh, right. And and call one of these young newly ordained priest name and with eight parishes and roll off six or eight parishes that they're going to be serving. It's like wow. And God love them. And 
you know, obviously I, I can't, I can't judge what's going sure. on there, but I, yeah. I can judge what's going on here. And I know we all know it's very, very difficult, very difficult. Any change is difficult. Sure. But the reality is that some change had to be made or we simply wouldn't have enough priests to serve as pastors. And I think it's a good note at this moment then also to say, as a reminder, we're at, I think this is going to air on, is it the 7th of July, Ron, this that this air airs? On... So we will have just yes. been a week into the new assignments yeah. of many of our priests. Yeah. So it's a good reminder, folks, you know, to say, and I hope, you know, I'm so grateful whenever I receive a letter that says, don't move our priests. Thanks be to God that the, our priests are held in such love and esteem. But they do move. And a number of changes have happened this year, one of the more difficult years since I've been here. So I simply would ask your prayerful remembrance for each pastor and parochial vicar who is in a new assignment, especially those in a newly perhaps configured twin or configured assignment, and to pray for them. And if you're in a parish like that with a new pastor, please support them, love them, tell them you're, you're behind them, and tell them what a man told me recently on a parochial visit— Bishop, we've got your back. What a blessing. Yeah. What a support to, to hear that. And he said, first, we have your back in prayer and in support. Please do that for our priests. There we go. Folks, we've got to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We've got a lot of questions to ask the bishop. Thank you. Stay right where you're at. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here at the Bishop's Corner. So glad you're with us, folks. We're with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Uh, he is always eager to get your questions, folks. Uh, easiest way to do that is email them to bishop at annunciationradio.com. Uh, we do ask, maybe you give us your first name, the parish you're from, your town, your something like that, so the bishop has some idea who he's speaking to. We do our very best to get them all on the air. We don't always make it, but we're doing our best. Bishop, uh, before we get to a question, I think we were meant to talk earlier and didn't do it, but an uh, update maybe on the uh, campaign. Oh, Ron, thank you, because we didn't get to that in the introductory yes, remarks. So, folks, just to note, as you're well aware, our diocese is in the midst of a major capital campaign called Living Christ. And I just want to give you an update, which is so edifying and encouraging and inspiring. So the gift is that we are now in wave one. There's still a number of weeks for those parishes. Remember, our pilot phase, folks, was tremendously successful. It was eight of our parishes from different parts of the diocese. They raised cumulatively over 156% of goal. Now we're in wave one with the number of our parishes in wave one. I think that's maybe 29 or 30 parishes. And as of this moment, there's still, I think, three to four more weeks of the general, general wave and folks, we are at approximately 90% of goal. What a tremendous gift. Now, one person said, well, if people hear that, then they won't give. Not true at all, because the reality is, in many of our parishes that have gone over goal, in fact, they've continued their extraordinary generosity because once they go over goal, you know, before the goal, it's 35% to the parish, 65% to diocesan ministries. Once goal is hit, 50% to the parish, 50% to diocesan ministries. I know one parish that is over 200% of goal. So it's proof that there is great generosity out there. It's proof that you good folks are looking at ways to be able to support the Catholic Church. And of course, the largest number, the majority of our parishioners and parishes have not yet engaged because wave two will be the fall of 2022. And wave three, the third and final wave, will be spring of 2023. Hmm. So please support in prayer our capital campaign. And you can go on the website, Living Christ. And I encourage you to think seriously if you have not yet or have not been called yet to give in or your parish isn't in it yet. And for those who have, my profound and heartfelt thanks for your great generosity. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Bishop. Thank We're you, Ron, for reminding uh, me. 
Next question, which is David St. Patrick of Heather Downs. Uh, Dear Bishop Thomas, how concerned are you about the number of priest seminarians in our diocese? Uh, What do we do if the numbers don't change or go down even further? You know, and could I comment, Bishop, on it? Please, Ron. We get a lot of questions about that. Mm -hmm. And that's so edifying that the, you know, the, the faithful... Are concerned. See it. Absolutely. Yes. So, because it's so amazing to many people, times we get that kind of thought. Yes. So, David asks, How concerned are you? As concerned as you are, <laughs> or if, if not more so, David. So, thank you for writing from St. Pat's Heather Downs. But I hope you know, too, our, our vocation director tells me, at least at the moment, through the next five years, given the number of seminarians that we have, and please God, the number of ordinations that we might have we will fundamentally be remaining stable. Now, that's also a reason, certainly, for intentional planning, because we won't have as many pastors as we had in the past. Certainly, a number of our pastors have retired, but we know many retired priests generously continue to assist in our parishes. And on top of all of that, David, we continue to have the great generosity of international priests serving with us. So that is a great gift as well. But I think, David, it simply highlights, and maybe this is part of our, you know, National Eucharistic Revival. I'm convinced, as we know, you know, with the church, without the Eucharist, there is no church. And without the priest, there is no Eucharist. So I would say it's just yet again another impetus for us to sincerely pray. And maybe during this Eucharistic Revival, we might be fostering just that kind of encouragement to deeply pray. And remember, I can tell you the, the prayer before the Holy Eucharist and being asked by someone, as Ron can tell you from his experience, being asked by someone, have you thought of the priesthood? Gee, it looks like you might have the gifts of, of what it takes to be a, a Catholic priest. That's the kind of engagement that stirs the hearts of some young men to consider seriously a vocation. And don't forget, I mean, I don't know how positive it could be, but I can tell you, David, the last uh, Andrew dinner that we had locally in the Toledo metro area had more young men than ever before, 60 young men. So I think the future is bright. The signs of hope are there. We simply have to encourage it. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks for the question. Now, this next question, Bishop, I would, we've been doing this, I think, for almost a decade now. That's I've been right. waiting for somebody to ask this question for 10 years. Oh, folks, you so, know, this is dangerous when Sam, you get that lead Sammy in from Sammy from Ron. Toledo says, Dear Bishop Thomas, if ah. you were elected pope, Heaven what is the us. first issue in the church that you would tackle and, and take on? Sammy, the answer to that is <laughs> none of them because I will not be elected pope. So there is no point in speculation, Sammy. With all due love and respect— I don't speculate and spend time on things that are not yeah, possible. But, but we, my dear dad used to say, it's either possible or probable. <laughs> Most things are could be possible, but they're not going to be probable. And I can tell you, Sammy, is it possible? Sure. Is it probable? Absolutely not. But Next question. No way, but you, <laughs> you could imagine that now that this has hit the airwaves on the Bishop Quarter, you could imagine a big headline somewhere, Bishop Thomas may be elected Pope. Uh, uh, well, that's you the know. way the media sometimes misconstrues things. <laughs> yeah. And then they would misconstrue it, Bishop Thomas okay. desires to be okay. Pope. But, that would be the headline. But if you were. Yeah, well, I would answer his question. I, what would you tackle? What I would, would be the first thing. I would not be Pope, so I'm, I, I'm not going to speculate. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks, Sammy. <laughs> okay, well, Sammy, we didn't get any answer to your question there. <laughs> but I've been waiting for Ron. Ten I years think we're going to number eight. <laughs> Judy from Joan of Arc. He's, he's Ron. trying to get me off. Judy of is okay. waiting for her. Right, Judy, her say answer. Joan of Arc. Here we go. Dear Thank Bishop you, Judy. Thomas. <laughs> You're so glad Judy's here to answer the ask this I question, am. right? I'm grateful. All right. Each year at the Chrism Mass, parishes receive new blessed oils to bring back to their respective parishes. What are the church's requirements in disposing of the previous year's oils? Thanks, Judy. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Ron, have we had that question? No, before? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, Judy, no. first, thanks for your, uh, your astuteness regarding the oils. Now, remember, uh, on... During Holy Week, those oils, you say blessed oils, true. One of those oils is actually consecrated. That's the chrism. So the consecrated chrism and the blessed oils 
the oil of catechumens, and the oil of the sick. Now, fundamentally, you want to know what are the requirements in disposing them. So I can tell you that the simple answer to that is the most common way of disposal is burning. And that burning actually takes place within the Easter Vigil. So it's interesting that those are set aside and they're put into containers usually or soaked cotton, and that's all placed, Judy, in the Easter fire. And so the oils, the sacred oils, which have been blessed or consecrated, are from the last year, are then burnt up in the Easter fire, and the new oils are placed in the new containers. So you, you might want to look, for example, at the Book of Blessings, chapter 32, and number 1127. Each year when the bishop blesses the oils and consecrates them, the pastor should see that the old oils are properly disposed of by burning and that they are replaced by the newly blessed oils. So that's it in a nutshell, Judy. I can tell you, you know, lots of places do different things, but it ha they have to make sure that the vessels are cleaned in an appropriate way. And even in the cleaning, that those things which are used for the cleaning, for example, if there are paper towels that assist in getting the oils out from the, or they dry the vessels, those are burnt as well. So I think in a nutshell, burning is the answer. All right, let's get Good. One, one more in, Bishop. Please do. Uh, Robert and Bowling Green, uh, dear Bishop Thomas, what can or is the diocese doing to help young people or anyone heed the call of a religious vocation? Same thing we were just talking about. Sure. So thank you. So Robert, I guess there is a question that I have about your question, and that is most of the times when somebody asks the call of a religious vocation, they're not necessarily talking only about religious consecrated life. They're talking, for example, about vocations to the diaconate, to the priesthood, or the consecrated life. So that's how I'm going to answer your question, Robert. And I think the way I can answer it is simply to say, please, you can go to our website for vocations to the diocesan priesthood. You can go to uh, the delegate, our sister, who is the delegate for religious in the diocese, and you can see all of the things that we're doing. I just mentioned in another question, Ron, yeah. the Andrew dinners. Yeah. There are lots of programs that are done for young people to encourage vocations. Our vocation director is very, very active and out there preaching and celebrating masses in parishes. He has retreats, for example, for college age men. And there are vocation directors of religious congregations who are out there hosting come and see, for example, opportunities. And I think, Robert, just a little while ago on, on this very show, I answered a question. There was a mother who wrote in about uh, that her children don't get to see consecrated women, sisters, very often. And I gave a, a number of examples for that. So the reality is that we are doing a good deal. And I think always, of course, Robert, we could do more, but we are go doing a good deal to help encourage young people and to expose them to the possibility of a vocation in the church as that is a religious vocation as a deacon priest or consecrated religious and 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 to just repeat what you said earlier and we've said so many times on the show thank you the diocese the parishes the priests everybody can do everything they do but the faithful have to be a part of that and they have to encourage young people to search for a vocation absolutely it may be and, you know, Robert, there's also many possibilities. Like, for example, I know in Bowling Green, you know, at St. Thomas University Parish, St. Thomas More University Parish, I know that the, the pastor is very enthusiastic about promoting vocations. And there are lots of opportunities. In fact, I was there for one for a Q&A with young people. Now, that it wasn't specifically for vocations. But as you know, any encounter with young people is going to be an opportunity to have them exposed to the possibility of a vocation. Yeah. All right. Well, Great. We are out of time now, Bishop. And if we could I'm get still a... struggling with this air cast, Ron. So <laughs> we could get a I'm trying to work process. with one arm and one hand. And hopefully, folks, you might see me in a little while without it. And that's my great. There you go. That's our goal. Thanks be to God. Well, let us pray the collect or opening prayer from the Mass of the 14th Sunday of Ordinary Time. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy, for on those you have rescued from slavery to sin, you bestow eternal gladness. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bishop. Ron, to you. Thanks to all of our viewers and listeners. How grateful we are that you join us. Blessings. See you again next week right here at the Bishop's Corner.